Hey there, are you ready to build a fitness business that becomes a true income producing asset? Then I welcome you to the Fitness Business Freedom Show brought to you by Fitness Revolution. I am your host, Justin Hanover, and we have over 15 years of experience building thriving fitness businesses, and we are committed to sharing our knowledge and expertise with you. You can expect to hear proven business foundations and frameworks, success stories from our coaching partners, and guest experts to give you straight answers for your biggest questions. It doesn't matter if you have an online business, fitness facility, or operate as an independent trainer. You are in the right place to grow your business and create the personal freedom you desire. Welcome to today's episode. I'm your host, Justin Hanover, success coach with Fitness Revolution. Before we dive in, I just want to give you a little heads up on who I have joining me and what you can expect here within this conversation. So today I have the pleasure of speaking with Lisa Lewis, and Dr. Lisa Lewis is a licensed psychologist and certified addictions counselor. She holds a master's degree in clinical counseling psychology and a doctorate in counseling and sports psychology. Lisa has worked in college mental health, community mental health, inpatient and intensive outpatient psychiatric and substance abuse treatment centers since her career began in 2003. She currently provides psychotherapy and consultation services at her private practice in Brookline, Massachusetts, and online as well. She is also the head of behavioral sciences at GWOL Health. Dr. Lewis specializes in working with athletes and athletically minded clients who struggle with mental health problems or addictions, as well as high achieving professionals who come to her practice to pursue goals, enhance motivation, or change behaviors. She also provides workshops, continuing education, and consultations to fitness professionals and athletes. And communication is an essential part to being a business owner and even more vital for a gym owner. And that's something we really dove into within our conversation with uh, Dr. Lisa Lewis today. And it, it's not just talking to talk either. Um, the communication is so much more than just opening your mouth and, and saying words. It's about effective communication and, and listening. And how are, how are you leading? How are you bringing your team together? And how are you keeping your members bought into the journey? If you want a thriving business, this skill set, you simply cannot delegate to anyone else. And Lisa breaks this down for us along with providing tactics to apply right away. Then she goes into her program she created to allow you to fully develop this particular skill set. And with that, she also provided us, our listeners, a bonus to save $75 on the Psych Skills for Fit Pros program. So that link and coupon code will be in our show notes. So be sure to check that out after you listen to this conversation. So with that being said, let's go ahead and bring Lisa onto the show. So today's episode is brought to you by Fitness Revolution. So you started your fitness business and been in the game now a few years. You might have even seen some good growth over those years, but now you feel stuck. You feel like momentum you once had just isn't there and you don't know how to get it back. Should you be focusing on your marketing, your sales, or your team? What is the next bottleneck to focus on that will allow you to break the chains holding you back? That is a great question. And one of the biggest skill sets as an owner is to be able to understand and identify the next biggest issue to keep your business moving forward. And that is exactly why Fitness Revolution has created our proprietary needs assessment to allow you to quickly see where your business stacks up and receive immediate feedback on what to focus on next. It's a quick 10 question assessment that will be able to provide valuable feedback to get past sticking points and hit your next goal. Whether you currently are stuck or feel frustrated with the progress or just wanna dial in what's currently working for you, this assessment is the first step to making that happen. I invite you to head over to the show notes where a direct link to the needs assessment will be so you can easily access it there. Now let's jump into today's show. Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to spend it with us and sharing your insights and your journey so far and helping other gym owners. Thank you, Justin. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So I always like to start with uh, our guests uh, giving our listeners a perspective, a thousand foot overview of 
how you became the Lisa that we're speaking with today. <laughs> um, so that is a long and winding road, but I guess I can boil it down to say that I am a psychotherapist by trade. So I earned a master's degree in uh, clinical psychology in 2003. I earned a doctoral degree in counseling and sports psychology in 2012. And since I finished my master's degree in 2003, I've been working in one way or another as a counselor. So interacting with people to help them change. Um, at the beginning of my career was inpatient psychiatry and inpatient substance abuse. I developed an addictions specialty uh, before I started graduate school back the second time. And then in my doctoral degree, counseling and sports psychology, I was working with athletes and started working with people who were not struggling with mental illness, but who wanted to level themselves up. So people who may have been thriving and very high achieving, but who wanted to improve so the concepts of performance enhancement and positive psychology and, and really counseling for anybody, regardless of whether or not they're struggling with a problem um, is something that I really loved finding my way to. And so after I finished my degree, I worked in college counseling for a little while, which I enjoyed because it was working with every kind of person that there is and uh, built my own practice. And in my own practice, I work with some folks who have mental health problems but the majority of people are very high functioning and um, either they're athletes or they're in some kind of high pressure, high stakes job, and they want to either change a behavior or improve themselves. And as I was building this business, I started to do consulting work and continuing education in the fitness industry because of my specific interest in motivation and exercise motivation. Mm -hmm. So my dissertation was about exercise motivation and um, I started speaking, doing in services or speaking at seminars and workshops at gyms or with fitness professionals around motivation and how to help clients change. Because what it seems to me is that once coaches understand the nuts and bolts of program design, anatomy, physiology, and you know sets and reps, really the tough work and the make or break is your ability to communicate effectively and to facilitate motivation and change with your clients. Absolutely. So that part of my business um, is a really exciting, fun part because I'm not a strength coach. I'm not a trainer. I'm not a gym owner. I am married to one. So I have a front row seat into that industry, but I really come in as a psychological consultant um, to help fitness professionals, not with the sets and reps in the programming part, but with how they can use communication to improve the psychology and basically the engagement and the outcomes for their clients. Yeah, no, I love that. It, it's like, that really is the differentiator of how people, like some people are able to get better results than others. And, it's, and like you said, it's not that they have some secret magic of uh, how they align their workouts and stuff and, and, mm -hmm. and do their programming. It's like you said, like how well they communicate to break through and, and help that person maybe shift their perspective. And this made me like you talking about this made me think back to like when I had my facility and one of my coaches um, came to me and this guy was like incredibly book smart, like and, and just so super smart, sharp person. But when it came to communication and people skills, it was like non-existent. And he was always so frustrated why what he saw as inferior trainers doing better than him financially. That's right. Uh, because like to him, it was like, what, what's this disconnect? Like, I, I know more, I can produce more, but I'm not getting more. <laughs> and, and that's where it was like, we had to have a conversation around this, obviously, of uh, how well you're able to communicate and, and to connect to, to people yes. uh, is really what uh, allows you to facilitate and to do your, your craft. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, I, I, I listening to your, your spectrum of what you've gone through. How do you feel uh, it has personally, like, shifted you like I, I, I was i'm always curious with people that like, like specialize in this area of how you use uh, the skills and stuff that you've been acquiring also on yourself and how do you feel like it has shifted the way that you go about things and, and your perspective mm. well i think where i've ended up is really a reflection of the things that i'm most passionate about and probably reflect like reflect who i am and my values that i have always 
been curious about what makes people tick. I, I think I was initially more interested in psychology, not for the idea of quote unquote helping people, but just of really understanding what makes people tick. So motivation is something I have cared about for as long as I can remember. And as I have, you know, gone through different training and then had a career, I really see the universality of how everybody wants to grow and change and improve and everybody struggles to do that. Everybody has a hard time getting out of their own way, no matter if you are a heroin addict or if you're trying to go from 8% body fat to 4% body fat, like Mm -hmm. life is a struggle and we all want to level ourselves up. And so the way that it's changed me is I think to learn to practice, to be less self-critical, to Mm -hmm. judge less and to plan and set goals more, to think more like a scientist. Okay. Here are the obstacles and here are the strengths I have and how can I pursue what I want and less, you know, when I think about myself in my early twenties, judging myself, criticizing myself, comparing myself, letting negativity and worry kick my ass as opposed to thinking like a, you know, I was trained as a quote unquote scientist practitioner, which is like, how can you observe your thoughts and your feelings and your behaviors and without judging them as being good or bad, evaluate what would be helpful and what would not be helpful, make a plan and then execute the plan. So I definitely think that my professional life and this whole world that I'm immersed in reminds me um, not to beat myself up um, and to try to take a step back and think objectively, not that, not to stop going after things, you know, definitely to still keep pursuing goals, but um, just not to be emotional about it, I guess Mm -hmm. I should say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that whole emotional thing can get us in trouble sometimes. <laughs> Just this idea that I think pe- most people's reflex when they have a hard time with change or they're ambivalent about changing or they're struggling is to judge themselves. And mm. often as coaches, I think one of the primary ways that people get burnt out in this industry is that when clients don't do the stuff you tell them to do, you either get mad at them or you question your own competency or you stress out and try to fix, quote unquote, the problem for the client. And many a people helper has run themselves into the ground by doing that, as opposed to taking a more objective scientific approach and saying, okay, here's the client's strengths, here's their weaknesses, here's where their ambivalence lies, because all of us are ambivalent about changing. And you know what, what would help me to increase this person's chances of being able to improve themselves or change? I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think that's a huge frustration for a lot of coaches and and, and gym owners is like pour, like feeling like they're pouring so much into people and not seeing the outcome that they want to see from that situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's a good segue into like, I want to obviously dive in more into the communication aspect um, yeah. of your expertise and uh along that line, like where are you seeing like some of the biggest areas um, that are needing of improvement when it comes to communication in general? Hmm. The fir- I guess the first word that comes to my mind is boundaries. And what I mean by boundaries is meeting the client where they are at and communicating with them about their goals, their values, their strengths, as opposed to talking about what you value, what you want to have happen, what um, your judgment or criticism is, or making it about you, your failure or success of getting the other person to change. You do not motivate other people. Other people have motivation and you can facilitate it. You can catalyze it. You can energize people or you can suck it out of them um, and thwart their motivation But when I say boundaries, what I mean is understanding that the client is the person who can make the client change and you are there as a collaborator and as a guide and not as somebody who's going to do their work for them. Um, So I don't know if that's super duper crystal clear, but that's kind of, I guess, the most general way I can answer the question. I I think coaches often think of themselves, what am I doing wrong? 
or, or where did I make a mistake or how can I motivate my clients? Like, what can I say, or what can I do that's going to give them this motivation as opposed to focusing more on what they're saying, what their identified motives are, what their goals are and working with that. Yeah, no, definitely. So like, let's actually like push into that a little bit more of that situation of the, the coach or gym owner being frustrated with the dynamic of the, the client relationship and how they're not moving forward, mm. especially with obviously like the past year or two with what we've been going through in the industry yeah. as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure this is not a, there's not a shortage of this type of frustration going around. Uh, so what are like, some things that like they should be analyzing as they're moving forward with this and, and helping this, their client, um, get out of their own way, if you will. Yeah. It's uh, to, to move forward. Yeah. So level one kind of counseling skills. 101 is to remember to have a client centered approach. So, so it's a little bit rough way to say it, but to say, this is not about me. I'm going to come in with tools. I'm going to come in with expertise. I'm going to come in with suggestions, but really the person who is going to change the game is the client. So how can I do everything possible to support whatever strengths or motivation they bring into the, into the picture? So if your client comes to you and says, I am motivated to lose 20 pounds because next May I have a 20 year high school reunion and I want to look hot at it. You might think, ah, that's a crappy motivation and they should want to get healthier, you know, because they should want to improve their health and they should want to get stronger and they should want to sleep better. And they should probably drink less. And you might have all these shoulds that maybe those are legitimate, but your client's not talking about that. Your client's talking about losing 20 pounds to look hot and whatever they are identifying as a motivation, you need to meet them there where they are at. And that's for two important reasons. The number one reason is that's the gas they have. That's the fuel they have. And you need to use the fuel that they have. Number two when you get somebody engaged around what they're motivated to do, so let's say you start working with that client and they actually start getting stronger, getting leaner, losing some inches, guess what you're doing? You're enhancing their motivation and you're having them week after week have multiple experiences of getting their reps in, of exercising and maybe feeling less stressed afterwards or sleeping better or or enjoying that they can do a body weight pull up or have some other kind of strength based outcome. And so maybe after three months, yeah, they've lost some weight, but they're like, I really like deadlifting. I feel like a badass when I do that. Or I really love how I sleep like a champ after I have a really good workout. And so you might get them to the place where they have the same shoulds, the same reasons to train that you initially had, but you're not going to get them there by saying, you know what? you should want to, you should want to exercise because it's going to make you feel better about yourself. And like, you really should be able to do a body weight pull. No, <laughs> that is not gonna, <laughs> that is not going to do it for them. So really meeting them where they're at and having faith that if they have a constructive experience and they start getting what they want, you're going to level up the quality of that motivation that's inside of them. Mm. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. And I can see, uh, especially a lot of like fitness professionals that I talk to, they almost like, I think like what you said, they hit, they come from the perspective of caring more about the message that they're preaching over what their client really wants. Uh, and, and, and I think like, what, what would you like, how would you help like say like a, a coach or fitness professional going around this mental block themselves of just giving into something like they see as giving into something like that mm. of like what they would deem as maybe more of a superficial mm. goal um to not, i guess not seem like phony or like like they're not legit um if they don't help the that client see right away like no like there's more to this like we need to like make something more this or there has to be a bigger goal that you're going after than just that uh, mm -hmm. i think like a lot of fitness professionals struggle with that of just being okay with that being the focus at the time. Yeah. And I think most importantly, what I want to do is validate that, that, you know, people who are in this industry are not in this industry because they want to be billionaires. And, yeah. you know, everybody is here because they, some version of, I want to help people. I want to inspire people. I want to make change. I want to, 
there's a really positive intention and everybody listening has spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, probably a lot of money to accumulate the knowledge and experience that they have. So of course you want your clients to listen to you mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, they're, they're giving you their money. Why do they not do the stuff you tell them to do? Why do they not, you know, they, they go to your website, they read your mission and values. They see what you are about, what kind of Kool-Aid you are. Why don't they come and say, give me a cup of your Kool-Aid and let me like, you know, change myself into this butterfly. They don't do that because that's not the way that human beings work. So you can have your mission and your values and the things that really, really matter to you. And you can also meet the client where they're at. You are the coach. So you are responsible for managing the relationship. And what you're going to do is not come preaching your mission and goals and values. You can state them. You, you want to make the client aware of, of who you are and what you're about. However, you pressing them about it or pressuring them is not going to enhance their motivation. It's going to thwart the motivation that they have, because let's say somebody wants to lose 20 pounds and they hear this lecture about, you know, being their, their best self and, and getting stronger to level themselves up. And they might be like, well, this guy probably thinks I'm a piece of shit because I, all I care about is being a size four. So they might actually feel guilt or shame or embarrassed. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because they don't feel that they're, they're, they're valid. Their reason is valid or good enough, or they feel like they're being judged or they're, or they don't feel like they're being heard. And so it's not going to be effective. And the number one thing that you need as a coach in order to get results is to engage your client. So you're not going to have any positive outcomes. If you cannot engage your client, there's going to be a certain percentage of the population out there that already loves the flavor of Kool-Aid that you are, that's going to come in and do everything you say and like sing your praises on social media. Those clients are fabulous. Those clients yeah. are the minority, you know? Absolutely. And so in order to work with the broadest range of clients and, and have a positive outcome, you need to be able to be flexible and hold in your mind. So what I do is I keep in my mind that if I can help somebody achieve their goal, I am going to enhance their motivation. I am going to be able to level up the way in which they're motivated. That's going to be more in line with my values and my mission and my purpose. So maybe I don't give a shit if they're a size four, but I absolutely positively care if they hold themselves in high regard and if they value doing things that are challenging and they're able to prove to themselves, even if I feel nervous or anxious about doing something, I can still approach it and do it. Mm. And so as the person who's the coach, it's up to you to know what you want and know what your needs are in terms of a coach and also to hold and to foster and to nourish your client's goals mm. uh, and to be able yeah. to kind of manage both of those, hold both of those at the same time. It makes complete sense. And, and I can see where your services would definitely be really needed in the fitness industry, like to start like pushing this message out there, because I, I think like thinking back to when, when I was more involved in it with my own facility, it definitely is heavily pushed, like, especially from like the from the sales perspective to not accept that, um, that you should push deeper, push deeper, push deeper. Um, and like, as if you're going to like hit like some magic um, mm -hmm. reason as to why this person is here and it's going to unlock everything. And then all of a sudden they're going to want to move forward and, and take action. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and I think that's where like, it's getting fitness professionals confused um, and possibly, like I said, like not establishing the relationship on the best foot. And now you have right. this person who's feeling vulnerable and possibly pissed off that <laughs> it's like that you're just driving into this, this thing that you think is there. Uh, and and it, it, now you're starting from a rocky start and, and it's not going to necessarily be as um, uh, fruit bearing, I guess, as you'd want it to be. That's uh, right. The client needs to know that you care about their goal and that you can help them achieve that goal. So if you devalue it, if you judge it, you're, you're really not starting off on a good foot. You want that rapport and that trust to be really solid. Now, just, I guess, speaking on that a little bit more, like, do you also find, like, is there ever a, a time when someone should, I guess, probe a little bit deeper or is taking what they say 
right off the bat, like for the most part, a good thing? Or can, is there a way to tell if like there is something more there or there isn't? I think, I think probing a little bit deeper is a great idea. And just the same way, you know, everybody out there who owns a gym, I assume you strength train and everybody knows how to find the sweet spot of there's a certain weight that's too easy to lift. And there's a certain weight that if you try to lift it, you're probably going to hurt yourself. And so you try to figure out where your strength meets, you know, the load. And, and so when you're asking questions and you're interviewing and you're communicating with your client, there's that same, when there's a lot of resistance and you feel like, you know, you're getting a stop from your client, then stop. Um, but to the degree to which you can find out what's underneath their goal. Yeah, go for it. So for example, let's go back to the client who wants to be a size four at their high school reunion. If I were to ask like, all right, tell me more about this size four and what that would be like for you to achieve that. The person might say, oh, I was a size four and I was in high school and I felt so good about myself and I felt like I could wear anything. And like, I just want to be back in that place where I just like, I'm not thinking about my muffin top or I'm not thinking about you know, how uncomfortable I am. So that gives me the information that it might not specifically be about the size four. It's about feeling comfortable in, in her own skin or feeling confident. And I might say, okay, it sounds like for you, the four really means feeling comfortable, feeling at ease, feeling nice in whatever it is you're wearing. So that helps me to feel a little bit better about what she wants. It's not as superficial and it probably helps her to be like, yeah, that is, yeah, I'm saying four because I was a four when I was 17, but mm. yeah, that's, that's right. And so that's nice. You're not saying, no, tell me something more meaningful and <laughs> philosophically important than size four. No, but you're, you're curious. I like to say things like, I wonder, mm. I wonder what that would be like, or I wonder what, what you would get out of that. Or I, I wonder what makes you say that. Um, because it's not putting the client on the spot, but it's showing curiosity, which opens the door for them to tell you more information. And if the client says, I don't know, I just want to be a four, then that's like, stop. <laughs> you don't really need more information because you know what you need to do is achieve a caloric deficit and have a training effect in the workout. You can work with that. You know, everybody who's listening knows how to do that. And then over the course of the time you're working with the client, hopefully you'll be able to establish more rapport and get to know the person better. And there will be other opportunities for you to kind of see if you can nudge that door open or dig a little deeper, like you said, and learn more about what is driving that individual. Mm. Yeah, you know, definitely. And then also in, in terms of like, say a gym owner that has like a team, like has like other coaches and stuff like that. Yes. Yes. Um, is, is that something you've also helped with, uh, with like helping the, the gym owner like portray this type of um, messaging to their team too. So that like, they're not, it's not only coming from one person. It, it's like kind of felt throughout the entire place basically. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the vibe? What's the ambiance? What's the theme in the gym? I love working with gym, gym owners because they care so much. They're so passionate. They have a brand, they have a mission, they have values. They have a reason why they went to all the trouble to open up their own gym and hire their own staff. And at the same time, they feel tremendous pressure to turn a profit and to keep their client, retain their clients. And so there are some really practical stressors that, you know, influence them sometimes to pressure their own staff or to feel confused about how to motivate clients or how to keep clients. Um, and so I, I do think that for those individuals that I've worked with in the past, it's been helpful for them to just have a place to talk about what they really want and what their stressors are and how to thread that needle of how to thread that needle of keeping their eyes on being profitable and being successful. And at the same time, being client centered and allowing for a variety of different goals and meeting the client where they're at and not trying to shove something down their throat. That's going to drive them away. Yeah, no, it, it definitely. Cause I think, I think that's where the difficulty lies within this industry. Cause like you said, in the beginning, a lot of people like, I haven't come across too many people that are like specifically opening up a gym um, or like a small boutique fitness facility with the goal of just getting rich. Like they're, they're doing this because of a passion, like mm -hmm. whether it impacted their life and somehow, and they want to now do it for others. Like mm -hmm. it, it's driven from some type of source of wanting to serve and, and 
um, to, to help other people. So like it can, it, it get, I guess it can get kind of blurry for them uh, in, in the sense of totally. like that business owner add on versus the, 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 the coach hat on Absolutely. Uh, and how they interact and, and to, to drive with people. So from the perspective of uh, the gym owner that say like has a team, what would you say would be some important actionable steps for them to make sure that they're aware of, I guess, maybe like their communication level of how they're going about communicating and maybe some ways that they can improve it. Yeah. Well, I think that they should, I think that it should be stated and known to their staff that this is something that is value of the gym and of the owner. And that I think gym owners are in a special spot where they can recommend or host what kinds of continuing education opportunities there are for their coaches. So, um, you know, coaches who promote, I want you to go to this seminar or this training or this workshop, or I want you to do this continuing education course, or I've, I've worked with gym owners who have, um, they're always reading a book, you know, maybe like over the course of a month, all the staff are reading the same book. And at the end of the month, they're talking about it. It's like, how do you select content that reflects what you feel is important? And, I'm sure there's a certain amount of content, you know, that, that is important about the latest barbell lift or the latest breathing technique or PRI thing or kettlebell thing. All of that stuff, of course, is important. However, you send a very strong message when you encourage your staff to either go to a seminar or you bring in somebody to do a workshop or an in-service that is about communication skills, psychological skills, motivation, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's an important thing to remember that it's like, well, sometimes we get thinking that like, just because you're the owner, you think everything has to come from you. And it doesn't. I mean, as long as you're facilitating what needs to be happening, you can bring other experts in, obviously, like yourself, like like Lisa, and how she can come in and work on this specific topic uh, to not only help you, the owner, but also help the, the entire team and, and the culture of, of what you're creating. Uh, so I think that's a, a great way to bring up, like, I know you have an amazing course uh, that helps people and helps coaches in this area, the psych skills for fitness professionals. Mm. So maybe you can just talk a little bit on that, uh, what that involves, what they can expect um, from that course and, and how it would help them in their careers. Yeah. So I developed psych skills for fit pros because of what I'm asked to talk about and who I'm asked to talk to. And so time and time again, I would do a podcast or I would do an in-service or I would do a one-on-one -on -one consultation with a gym owner. And, you know, people would ask me like, what can I read to learn more about this? Or how could I learn more about motivation, but in a gym or a fitness setting? And really, you know, I didn't have very much to draw from that was specific to this context. So a couple of times people were saying like, you should put something together. So I, I put together um, Psych Skills for Fit Pros Volume 1 to address really the foundations of communication and understanding the psychology of your clients who you're trying to help change. So the course is 1.3 CEUs. It's approved by NASM and the NSCA. And so it's, it's roughly 13 hours of content. It's an online study at your own pace course. And it covers the self-determination theory of motivation. So how does motivation work? What are different qualities of motivation? And specifically, I focus on application. So how can coaches leverage, assess the kind of motivation there is, leverage that motivation to facilitate change and to persist over time? Um, the second key curriculum is around the stages of change or the trans-theoretical model of change. So what helps people to get out of their own way? And what does that process look like? And how can you use techniques and processes to move your client along through the change process? And then finally, I've, the third core piece of the curriculum is motivational interviewing. What is it? How can you use it in nutrition and fitness settings? And how can you, how can you practice those skills in a way that's authentic to you? Not just like reading some textbook and mm. restating the sentence, but like, what would it actually look like? No matter if you're introverted, extroverted, a rah-rah coach or a zeni coach, how could you use these skills in a way that feels natural for you and also helps to facilitate motivation and change? I love that. And 
I don't listen to you talk about, it, I think this would be something that would just benefit you, benefit you in pretty much every area of your life, not just uh, <laughs> in your career. I mean, just your, your personal relationships. I mean, everything I, I think would uh, obviously improve uh, as you, I think, become more aware of this space and be more conscious behind what it is that you're doing and saying. Uh, I think that's a, a really valuable skill set. So maybe you speak real quick to like the, the person that is like, wants to go after like they need like another uh, course on what a corrective exercise or, or going for this course on, on like psych skills. Why would you feel like it would, this would be more beneficial or like an area, especially if there's something that they haven't really pursued to learn more about and a skill set to learn more about um, to turn their attention towards something like this and, and how it can ultimately help them do their craft better. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, I would actually ask back to the, to that person. I would say what, you know, what do you want to get out of a training? How, how could your skills be improved? And that could either be what, well, if I waved a magic wand and you were a quote unquote better coach after I waved my magic wand, what would be different? Would it be your ability to write a program, your understanding of sets and reps? Would it be, you know, how to coach a deadlift better? Would it be how to motivate people and facilitate change? Would it be how to handle wicked negative clients who are always self-sabotaging? Would it be understanding how to set limits so you don't get sucked dry and resent your clients who are really needy? So I would wonder, so there might be some people out there listening who are like, no, I really need to understand how to coach a deadlift. And that's kind of one-on-one and that's where I'm at. And if that's where you're at, that's what you should focus on. But if you do a needs assessment of yourself and think about if I were a better coach tomorrow, what would be different about me? What would be better about me? And if it has something to do with how you work with your clients, how you interact with them, and that can be verbally, it can be via email, it can be DM, however it is that you work with your clients. Um, if your people helping skills would be better and that would result in you being a better coach, then this is the course. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's, and where's, um, where are they able to get access to this? Oh, thank you. Yeah. So people can go to my website, which is drlewisconsulting.com um, and look under the products tab, or they could also just go to psychskillsforfitpros.com uh, and they can find the course there. And if people are listening on your podcast, I do, excuse me, I do have a discount code that I offer for people who have heard about this. And so if anybody's listening and they, they would like a little discount, I would encourage them to um, send me an email or I can share it with you and you can have it in the email with the, what the code is. Um, it's for $75 off the course. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you for offering that. Mm -hmm. yeah, we would definitely appreciate that. And I, I do hope you guys take her up on that and learn a new skill set or advance your skill set in this area because i can i promise you you, you won't uh, regret it in, in that sense of it being able to move your career along move your life along move your business along uh by improving these skills uh, but as we work towards wrapping up the conversation uh, at least as i mentioned to you before we started recording i like to kind of wrap her up with your perspective on what you think is most important for a gym owner right now. So like if a gym owner came to you looking for support, um, based on obviously your background, your experience, what do you feel is the most important thing that needs to be said to them right now? Mm. Well, the first thing I think about is self care is mm. how are you managing your stress? because there's plenty of it, you know, how are you doing would be what I would ask if I sat down with a gym owner, um, because they are worrying about so many things and there's an unbelievable pressure, um, that is on gym owners, especially in light of the last two years and, and what has been going on. So I guess for me, I would want to know what's your self-care regimen. And do you take that as seriously as you take your training regimen or your nutrition res regimen, because your ability to persist and be resilient throughout all this and to maintain your business and to actually enjoy your business is to take good care of yourself. So just the same way you have to recover after you train hard, you have to take care of yourself and, and have downtime and off time in order to sustain your business. 
you know, love that message. It's such an important message. And I think one that's even more of a real message than ever after the past year or so we've, mm -hmm. we've gone through things uh, uh, in this industry. So it's something to really take seriously because you're, if you're in this for the long game, you can't, you can't burn yourself out <laughs> too quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, Lisa, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, for everything that you're doing in your own work and with your own personal growth and also how you are pushing others to grow around you. you know, we really appreciate everything you are contributing. Well, that's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And along with those websites that you entered before, do you also want us to, we can include your email in the, in the, the show notes as well if anybody wants to personally reach out to you? Yes, you can include my email. And also I, I will give you my Instagram handle. It's at Dr. Lewis okay. consulting. And if people are not finding it in their budget to purchase the course right now, my Instagram feed is filled with strength training and mental health and resilience and motivation content. I try to have three pieces a week. So that's another easy way to get a little dose. Excellent. Great. You know, and like, as I mentioned, we'll have all those links for you guys to easily access. Uh, and I, again, I do hope you do reach out to Lisa, uh, whether it's to ask a simple question or to pursue the course. Uh, that's how things open up. That's how doors open up when you, you take that first little step uh, to make something happen. So make that happen for yourself. And, and also everything that we've talked about within this episode don't just listen, apply. Like, so if you have to re go back through this and take notes, actively listen um, to things like Lisa's talking about and write down what speaks to you, what makes sense to you uh, and start creating a list of what that looks like with action steps to it. Uh, so you actually benefit from this episode and not just be uh, another podcast that you listen to. Uh, and that's really the, the goal behind this and what we want to make sure that we're doing is striving to, to be better in our businesses. So with that said, I want to thank you, the listener, obviously, because we wouldn't have a show if you weren't listening. Uh, and we're happy that you're looking for ways and resources to improve your business. It's such an important thing to keep doing. Um, and with that being said, thank you so much. I look forward to having you join us on the next episode of the Fitness Business Freedom Show. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode on the Fitness Business Freedom Show. On behalf of Fitness Revolution and myself, we are thrilled you are looking for ways and resources to move your business forward, and we are honored to be that source for you. If you would like to receive more business building support from us, be sure to head over to the show notes and join our subscriber list and stay on top of all the industry insights that matter most to you. Now, before I close out today's show, if you found this episode beneficial in any way, I just ask you to leave us a simple review to help other gym owners find us and discover this show. Thank you so much, and I will see you on the next episode of the Fitness Business Freedom Show.